Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, it is often said that news is the first draft of history. It can be remarkably accurate, can sometimes have gaps and holes, but by and large, it does, it does happen to be that first draft. News also travels really fast in today's society, the blink of an eye, the quickness of a Facebook post or a tweet or a YouTube video, get the word out and about to just about anyone, anywhere, anytime. Well, the same thing was true during the Civil War. News could travel fast, not quite as fast as it does in the digital age. However, it did move pretty quickly as evidenced by mass media, mass communications, the telegraph. And in fact, I've got a case in point to share with you in this episode. May 24th, 1861, on that day in Alexandria, Virginia, Elmer Ellsworth, the colonel of the 11th New York Infantry, was famously or infamously killed by a shotgun blast after he hauled down a Confederate flag from the Marshall House in Alexandria, Virginia. It's a well-known story. All of you students of the Civil War know all the details about it. The shooting of James Jackson, the man who shot Ellsworth, his shooting by one of Ellsworth's men, Frank Brownell, is part of the history books. The first versions of that story were moving quickly. In fact, by late on that same day, readers of New York newspapers and in other places were already getting firsthand accounts of what happened. So imagine news happens in Alexandria, Virginia on a May day in 1861. And that night, folks are reading about it in the late edition of their newspapers. I want to share this account, and it has the it has the title, Still Another Account, which gives you a sense of how quickly the news was moving. This appeared in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in that evening of May 24th, one of the late editions. And listen to the facts that are described, listen to the names, listen to the sense of urgency. It's pretty remarkable, I think. So without further ado, let me get you into this. Again, the title, still another count. Quote, Alexandria is taken, but at a heavy cost. Colonel Ellsworth is killed. He was shot dead while descending the stairs of the Marshall House with a secession flag, which he had torn down from a staff on the roof. The man who shot him was instantly dispatched by Francis E. Brownell of Troy, New York, a private of Company A in Colonel Ellsworth's regiment. The retribution was instantaneous. The colonel was shot through the breast by one charge of a double-barreled gun the other charge entering the waistcoating near him. He fell on his face, only exclaiming, my God, and the blood gushed from his wound with such profusion as to drench the entire passage. A few seconds afterwards, he uttered a low moan, but his eyes were instantly fixed and he had ceased to breathe. The house was in the utmost confusion. The ledgers darted from the rooms, but were held in control by the four or five zouaves who accompanied the colonel and who at once established and maintained order. It was a long time before a reinforcement arrived and it was almost thought we might be hemmed in by the number of persons in the house, which was considerable, but the trepidation was too great from any organization and nothing of the sort was attempted although I think that the Zouaves, mad with grief at the loss of their leader, would have been but little disappointed if it had been. He, Ellsworth, was laid upon a bed in a room near at hand with the rebel flag stained with his blood and now a trophy to his glory about his feet. 
The surgeon who soon arrived satisfied us that he had expired at the moment of his being shot. The man who killed him was James W. Jackson, who proved to be the keeper of the house. He must have died as suddenly. He was shot through the head and afterward ran through the body by the saber bayonet of the same private. That's Brownell. His wife presently discovered the fatality and, approaching the body, uttered the most agonizing cries, and although treated with the utmost consideration that could be offered her in her misery, she remained for a long time in the wildest state of frenzy. The 1st Michigan Regiment entered Alexandria about six o'clock, an hour after the appearance of the Zouaves, and captured a body of cavalry, who at first demanded time to consider their surrender, but were forced to yield their arms without delay. Other regiments are expected. Colonel Ellsworth was the only person of our side killed. Surgeon Gray made an examination and discovered that the slugs from the gun entered between the third and fifth rib, shattering the fourth rib, and pushed into the left oracle of the heart destroying all of the instruments with which it came in contact. The colonel was conveyed up to Washington in the steamer James Guy. The persons who were around him at the moment of his fall returned to him. His remains will lie in the Navy Yard until the proper solemnities are prepared by the authorities. The occupation of Alexandria, so far as the attention and action of the Zouaves was concerned, was a thorough success. They were the first regiment to arrive. They were, by water, from their encampment and reach Alexandria a little after dawn. The rebel sentries fired an alarm and fled. The town was entered without resistance, and but for the melancholy event, which now seems to overshadow the success of the expedition, no gloom upon its brilliancy could be seen. So there you have it. First-hand accounts. The writer is not credited, and I haven't done enough research to try to find out who this person was, but it certainly seems like it might have been a reporter or some other individual who was traveling with the Zouav Regiment, a.k.a the 11th New York Infantry and Colonel Ellsworth as they came down from Washington, D.C., along the Potomac, got onto the streets and then walked down. And of course, Ellsworth meeting his fate when he attempted or successfully hauled down the flag only to be shot as he attempted to walk downstairs with the flag. So a really interesting piece of news. And again, the urgency and the immediacy of it really grabs you. And imagine folks in major cities in the eastern part of the United States getting these news updates in the late editions of their newspaper the same day that it happened. Pretty interesting stuff. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the trail.